for a long time, I really didn't trust myself at all, you know? Mm. And so, I mean, I say that to say, like, I'm the person who wrote a book, yeah. who, who's very you know, brave and honest in it. And I'm also the person who didn't trust herself at mm. all and was like afraid to speak, is still afraid often to speak or to say how I feel. My worst fear is like someone knowing that I have needs or having to do what I need, regardless of whatever that anyone else is doing, because this is what my body needs from me right now. And realizing that I was able to do that actually mm. whoa i had willpower every small decision that i made that was a good decision for me proved to me that i could make good decisions for myself okay. and and with every single thing that i did and decision that i made and change and blah blah i built trust with myself welcome to third culture therapy this episode i'm here with ali Amuro to discuss all things mental and emotional well-being like we do on the show that is at the intersection of mental health and culture but before we begin a little bit about my lovely new guest um, Ali Amuro is an Egyptian-born, London-based writer and author of the best-selling uh, book, The Greater Freedom, uh, Life as a Middle Eastern Woman Outside the Stereotypes, um, a non-fiction, her non-fiction book, a uh, debut book. Um, and uh, Alia is also the founder of The Greater Conversation newsletter and community, of which I am a subscriber. And a contributor. And a contributor, that's true. <laughs> that is very true. Uh, she is also the host and producer of a podcast called The Talk of Shame, great title, uh, which discusses all things shame and how it impacts our daily lives. Um, she's currently working on a number of TV projects and your second book, yes, I heard, indeed. which is very exciting. Welcome to Third Culture. Therapy. Thanks for having I'm me. Really excited to have you here. I know we've been talking about this for a while, so it's great to finally talk. I'm going to start the way I normally start um, with my guests, which is to ask you about your identity. There are a lot of ways that I described you and many more that you may describe yourself. Uh, Middle Eastern woman, Egyptian, uh, London, UK writer, all of these podcaster. Um, what is the identity that you most closely align with and why? Ooh, uh, <laughs> um, I think a woman. Mm, yeah. I had a feeling you were going to say yeah, that. Did you? I did <laughs> have a feeling you were going to say that. Yeah, I think I identify mostly as a woman. Uh, I feel like... I mean, this is what's coming to my head, so this is what I'm going to say. When I wrote my book, The Greater Freedom, and it came out, I realized a lot of things in the writing, obviously. One of them was that there are many, many, many more things that we have in common as women than we do different, right? Mm. And so the subtitle of the book is like, Life is a Middle Eastern Woman. And like that was very much my initial entrance into the story was like, these are the things that I feel, you know, like I'm going to go straight in, but like sex, for example, it's something that like as quote unquote Arab women were told, you know, maybe don't really do that. Like maybe don't really, <laughs> maybe, don't do <laughs> maybe wait till you have a ring on your finger, <laughs> you know, all of that. Right. Yeah. So that was kind of, these were the things that I thought were like, maybe cause I'm Arab, you know? Mm. And then I wrote the book and I realized oh, lol, actually, no, these are things that all women everywhere are told to more, and I'm just using sex as an example, there's, you know, countless things, um, to more or less degrees, these are things that we are told everywhere, oh, oh my God, turns out the patriarchy is alive and well everywhere. <laughs> so that was a big, like, realization. And then mm. when the book came out, I received so many messages from women you know, all over the world from all different cultures, all different religions being like, I related so much, you know, me too. Same, 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 basically. And so, yeah. Yeah, that's incredible that you got that from such a diverse uh, group of women and you, you realize that commonality. I mean, it's a great book. I loved reading it. Um, you see, I have these sticky tabs. I even, love that. I when I first read it, even before we even met. So these are legit 
sticky that pads. makes not, me really not part happy. of just part of the research <laughs> for today yeah um it was a book that i of course um would have loved to have read growing up as an arab woman in the uk and i i imagine that is part of the reason why you wrote it in fact i think you said that in in your introduction but i was intrigued by the subtitle you chose mm. i totally understood it but what do you see as an Arab woman or Middle Eastern woman outside the stereotype? I mean, it's been six years since I started writing the book, maybe seven, four years since it came out. I have a hundred different ideas now. Yeah. I definitely would not have put Middle Eastern. I'm okay. trying to not say Middle Eastern anymore mm. uh, because it's a colonialist term. Mm. So I'm now trying to say Swana, Southwest Asia, North Africa instead. Yeah, so that's number one. And I think the, the the point of the subtitle almost was to be like, like I was almost so conscious of the stereotypes, whether those exist from like, quote unquote, the West, mm -hmm. or even the stereotypes from within like our own culture of like what we're supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was what I was trying to say in that. That's why it says outside the stereotypes, because I'm like, these stereotypes are bullshit. They don't even exist. And that's what I was trying to say. Mm. Did you feel like restricted by these stereotypes? And perhaps you can, growing up, you did. Yeah. Even though like from reading your book and, and knowing a bit about your lifestyle and upbringing, you, by your own account, grew up in a fairly open-minded, like liber liberal, culturally liberal mm -hmm. family. That's exactly what made me want to write the book. Right. Because I was like, I grew up in this like super chill family, basically. There's, um, it's tiny, you know, how like we always have like hundreds of aunties and uncles and everyone's a pit. I don't have any of that. Yeah. I don't have aunts and uncles, basically. Like my family is really small. And again, they're chill. And I grew up in London since I was eight years old. Why do I still have this kind of like burden of expectation? Whose is it? Right. And that's where the book came from. Yeah, it's a, the, system, the systemic issues and the subconscious and the things that we take for granted without questioning. What are some of the most problematic stereotypes in your mind? I mean, there are many, but mm. for you. As an Arab woman. As an Arab woman. Uh, that were oppressed. Mm. Um, that were not sexual beings. That one really bothers me. <laughs> I mean, but again, these are not just Arab women stereotypes. These are women stereotypes, right? So, but like that we are not meant to be ambitious, mm -hmm. that we are meant to be caregivers, yep. that we, our duty on this earth is to like get married and have children and to look after them and abandon ourselves in the meantime. Uh, I mean, I'm revealing a lot. <laughs> my own uh, therapy conversations <laughs> um but yeah these these are the these are the expectations or the st or the stereotypes or the shoulds yeah um and i think separating ourselves from those and like learning how to listen to your own wants and giving them importance is the big time journey that i've been on mm. and what sort of got you to take that journey because you know a lot of people a lot of well let's keep it specific a lot of arab women would not necessarily poke that hornet's nest and ask a lot of questions and of course it's not just you know specific to arab women but we are talking about them in this context mm. and with this cultural background that you know is the sort of mm. theme here um would it necessarily uh, for a variety of reasons. Either they don't want to rock the boat or it just doesn't occur to them and they're so within a particular mm. system and mindset that it's like, we just continue. What was it for you that made you think, no, I want to explore something here? I don't think I had a choice. Mm. I think I was kind of always like this. Like one of my mom's best friends, my aunt, um, quote unquote in Arab words, she made a really like, she said something to me recently and I've just, it's really feels like it sums me up as a person. I must have been like six or something in her story. And we were all on holiday together, like my family, her and her kids, da, da, da. 
And I went down for breakfast, apparently, one day. And it was just like me and her. I don't know where my parents were. And I basically said something to her like, oh, yeah, my parents are like fighting and they're like screaming at each other or something. And she was like, oh, yeah, you can't say that. And I was like, why not? It's the truth. <laughs> yeah, kids always say the truth. Uh, well, that is that is true. And maybe it's not just like a me story. No, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is a used to. But I mean, like kids do. It's, it's Yes, yes. But I feel like that was always like, but it's the truth. But it's yeah. the truth, you know? Yeah. And I think that I've just, yeah, I mean, I just didn't really, I just didn't ever sit well with me mm. ever, ever, never sat well with me. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, just growing up, like, again, not having hundreds of people, like I sp- sort of felt like I'm able to write this book. I'm able to say the truth. I'm able to go on this journey because I can, you know, Mm -hmm. and I remember when I was writing the book, I said to my dad, like, listen, by the way, like I'm writing about sex, like I'm writing about how I lost my virginity, like, or I'm going there. Just FYI. And he basically said to me, listen, either say the truth or don't bother. Wow. Yeah. Good on him. And I was like, okay, thank you so much. That was the permission I kind of wanted. Well, like was yeah. going to pretend I didn't need. I can and I have to because I have no choice. Mm. I think that's why I'm here. Mm. Not to get too like woo-woo about it. Yeah, like a, like a bit like your purpose. I was interested, like when you said it didn't sit well with you, I, I, did un- I also understood that um, when I brought it back a little bit to my perspective, because in a way we have quite similar upbringings. Our parents brought up in London, small nuclear family, no extended family here. I mean, had them in Syria and Libya, but not really like here, not at all really. Um, so, and quite different our nuclear family to the extended family mm. uh, abroad, just lifestyle wise and just outlook and sort of degree of liberalism, etc. So I understand having that privilege and that added freedom. And also then you get a different perspective on things and you see the question more. I think also for me, when I got to a point where it didn't sit well with me, like it didn't sit well with me to not to not be authentic yeah. anymore. Like it, I struggled with myself. I, and I, I think it contributed probably to some of my, you know, difficulties mentally, emotionally, mm-hmm. when like I felt not being actually really fully accepting of the differences within me because you feel like the sense of need to conform Mm. and you're not necessarily living life the way everybody else does. And particularly when you come from a sort of, you know, an immigrant background, you already have, I think, within you this desire to want to belong and conform, but actually my personality isn't of one that conforms. Mm. But I was not fully accepting that. And, and take pride and joy in that, which I do now. But I think my journey there was through like actual a lot of discomfort mm. for not being who I am. That's so interesting. It, it's great. I think that you didn't, that you didn't have to go through that. You were more trusting of your voice and maybe your view early, earlier on. I mean, I don't know if I would say that, to be honest. I think, you know, it's a really, it's a really difficult one. And I, I like, I feel like, I grew up like, I mean, alhamdulillah, so, so are, alhamdulillah, but I grew up in a house where like everyone was beefing. Mm. Like it was, <laughs> it, there was a lot of drama right, in right, my house. Right. Like every, it was every man or woman for themselves, <laughs> really, like really, really. And so I think that um, as a teenager, I was just rebelling, but I didn't know why right. or what I was rebelling against. I was just really mad. I was really mad. Like, I was like, why are you fucking shouting? Like, what is, what the mm. fuck, you know? And so I went off the rails, my parents yeah. would say, <laughs> you know, and I'd sneak out and I got like one time and I was so proud of myself. I got quadruple grounded. Wow. What does that even mean? Qu- grounded four times on top of each other. Oh. <laughs> Somehow I did something while I was grounded that got me more groundings, including sneaking out. Anyway, I was really proud of myself at the time. And so I think I kind of, it was almost like part of my identity, this rebel. Yeah. And actually this, this really funny, I had a, I have one of my best friends in Egypt 
And she was so much naughtier than me. Like, oh my God, the things that she was doing. But she didn't say anything, you know? She was the good girl in front right. of our parents right. and in front of all the families. She was like, the really cute. I, on the, in the meantime, was considered the like naughtiest motherfucker. But I actually wasn't even really doing anything. I was just being really loud about it. Yeah, anything yeah, that I yeah, was yeah, doing yeah, yeah. because I was like, no. Yeah, you, you know? For you, it was also like a statement. I was like, like I'm not down. It was a protest. <laughs> it was a protest. <laughs> so I think for a long time, like I said, I didn't know what I was rebelling against at all. And it was only when I started to get quite a bit older. Like, I mean, honestly, in my like mid-20s, really, like just about the time that I started to write mm. this, I would say, that I started to be able to to pinpoint what was rubbing me up the wrong way so much. Um, do you now feel that those limitations, whether within you or society, are more, do you get them more from within your community or external to your community? And by community, I'm talking mm. loosely the Arab community. Mm. I think I feel them more from within my community in terms of like, I call it in the book, like the invisible jury, mm. you know? And I definitely, but I don't know if it's me. Like, I don't know if they actually care. Right. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, or is it just in my head? Like, you know, I'm I'm 34 now, I'm single, woo hoo. Um, I'm that's not just like a, that's like a genuine one. And whenever I go to Egypt, I feel a little bit like, or right, do you guys feel sorry for me that I'm single? Cause I'm really good. Like, are yeah. you guys, are you guys okay? Yeah. Because uh. actually I'm good. And I feel like, I don't know if, if they actually are thinking that. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do know exactly what you mean. And it's funny you should mention that because I remember probably around your age feeling very similar and thinking, gosh, I actually like feeling really great about where I'm at and me and this and that, but the, and like happy to be single. The one thing I don't like is the idea that people might be feeling sorry for me. Yeah. And I was like, I really don't want that. I don't want people to be looking at me with like pity and like, I'm sorry for, you know, and I, and, but, but you're right. I wasn't, I think that was very much in my head. Yeah. Um, there's a very specific life that we're supposed to live, yeah. right? It's supposed to look a very specific way. And I think the reason why I say like within the community, I feel it more is because within the community that is much more entrenched. Like in London, for example, as an example, I have many different friends who are living many different lives. Mm. You know, I have a friend who wanted to have children so badly, like she really wanted kids. So she moved to the countryside. She adopted the child alone. She has no partner, right? I have another friend who, you know, mm. people are single, people are married, people are gay, people are in open relationships, people are polyamorous. Like, there's so many ways of living, right? And I'm also just living in my way. But when there's like, this is what it looks like, A, B, C, end goal, and you're not living like that, it feels like you think I'm just behind in your life. Yeah. But I'm not. Yeah. I'm living another life, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I'd say within the community more. But again, maybe it is my projection. In your book and in your newsletters, since you've written a lot about physical appear appearance and the changes, well, expectations on women in general, that's quite well known on Arab women, we have perhaps an additional layer. But you've also spoken about it from this multi-pronged again, uh, which you do throughout the book, multi-pronged, both from like internally within your community and also this external, like how it is perceived within Western culture and also through like more of an imperial colonial lens, mm. which is something you've discussed more recently in your, in your writing. How has your relationship with your physical appearance changed over the years that you have been writing and exploring these topics? When I was much younger, I felt very insecure about my appearance. And that would be things like, 
my bum would be big, you know, was bigger than my friends. Like my thighs were bigger. Like I had more body hair. I mean, not more body hair, darker body hair. So it looked more obvious. Uh, my curly hair, you know, there was a lot of things that I felt very like unattractive. And there's a story that I write in the book and I had just moved to London um, and there was this boy that I like really fancied. I was eight or like nine, you know, it was like a baby, but like I really fancied this boy and he turned out to fancy me too, right? And then I remember the two like popular girls in the class who were like these two white blonde girls, they cornered me on lunch at lunch break. I remember this so well. And they basically said to me like, I don't understand why he likes you, you're brown. Mm, I remember reading that. I was and so sad for little <laughs> you when I read that. I was like, no. I know. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh my God, I am brown, you know? <laughs> and that was like, yeah, really like wild. Um, and so that kind of, that sort of feeling of like, oh, I'm not attractive. I'm not, you know, the what people think is uh, whatever. Mm. Lasted for quite a long time, actually. And then, I mean... The difficult thing is, right, and this is something that I'm having to reckon with still, when your body shape or your look becomes mainstream or popular and all of a sudden you are considered attractive, what then? Like, do I only now consider myself attractive because, like, the world kind of does, you know? Mm. So I'm having to still reckon with that a little bit, but I definitely feel I don't... Alhamdulillah, I'm actually so grateful, like go me that I managed this, but I feel like I don't place as much importance on what I look like as I used to. Mm -hmm. And that's because I'm way more than what I look like. Like I wrote in the book, like I concluded the chapter with this line that I really like. And I basically said like, the way I look is actually the least interesting thing about me. Yeah. And I really feel that, you know, like I have, I have a brain, I have like, I'm nice. I'm a good friend. You know, like there's so many other things about me than what I look like. And so as much as, of course, you know, it's the first thing anyone sees and I do like to look good and I love a good selfie, as anyone who follows me on Instagram will know, I don't want that to be the thing that I base my worth on Mm -hmm. or my feelings on or anything else really like it's an additional nice thing yeah. cool done finito it must be quite hard though when you are in the public domain and you do have like a public profile and that is kind of what is asked of you i mean not specifically of you but of people who mm. are in that space it's i find it intriguing like you can know these things yeah but then it's like the act of doing it like you have to then get into a certain mindset. Mm, mm. Like I see it when I, I don't, I don't do, I personally don't post like a lot of my like face. I do it sometimes because I know like if I want a particular reaction. That's how you get the likes. That's how I get the likes. <laughs> but then yeah. like when that happens and I see them like streaming in, I'm like, whoa, mm. a, you know, popular day. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this feels great. But yeah. then I can see like how, like how addictive that mm. can be. And um, I don't have, like, I don't have the answer to that because there is also, you know, then there's a conversely, you find you can hide away from it, but then, you know, you're not sort of in that arena, mm. you're not playing that game, which has its other maybe consequences if, if that's important to you. But what's your, like, hack if you have one? I think it's like, try and like, I try and root myself in other things, yeah. you know? Um, I mean, it's interesting. I was really unwell. I mean, nothing like I'm fine, but I was unwell last year to the extent that I had to completely change my whole lifestyle Mm -hmm. completely. I cut out everything I love, no carbs, no dairy, no sugar, no alcohol, nothing, nothing. I couldn't eat anything. And I ended up losing a shit ton of weight, Mm. a shit ton of weight. And that was really wild, really wild for me, actually, because I have always fluctuated. I mean, everyone fluctuates, right? And I'm like, it's fine. It's temporary. I mean, I never, like, I'd gain weight and I would never be like, I gained weight because whatevs, like, tomorrow. I mean, alhamdulillah, I never, like, made that thing. But when I lost, like, so much weight like that and people started to 
comment like wow mm. you look amazing I you wrote that. yeah i wrote a newsletter about this and like it was so disconcerting because it was like what are you guys trying to say and like also this is really dangerous that we've made i'm sick i can't eat like and you're telling me i look amazing like you're saying i'm i look good sick you know yep well when i at my most depressed period when i was having like the worst time mentally emotionally and and uh and as a consequence i wasn't eating um well at all and mm. so i lost a lot of work, weight was the time i got like the most mild compliments and it drove me mad i was like you can't see but it also was such an interesting insight to like people cannot see what is going on yeah. inside you you know i looked like hot thin like i had a good job like supposedly it was like tick 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 mm. you know all of the tick boxes and i was like devastated inside and i would say you cannot trust that you really can't trust the physical appearance you don't know what's going on yeah. inside people yeah. but it also really bothered me because i also made that same connection i was like damn we're celebrating sick because also even if you didn't know like you should be thinking questioning why the hell did your friend of i like all these years lose suddenly mm -hmm. all this weight mm -hmm. you're not you like amazing <laughs> but i think also like what's so weird is that same thing of like what people see on the outside and actually i found i do find that with social media to go back to like the social mm. media thing i remember like a good few years ago now i me and my like long-term boyfriend broke up and i was like really sad obviously and i didn't post about it on instagram because i'm sad and i'm <laughs> processing it so like i'm posting other stuff but yeah. not this right and i remember i went to egypt and i hadn't been in a while and my friends were like, my friends, like my homies mm. were like, oh, we know everything about you because you're always online. And I was like, well, actually, this huge thing has happened that I didn't post. And can you please fucking ask about me and not just assume that the things that I'm posting for however mm. many thousand people are the actual only thing? Like the chances are the really serious big stuff. I'm not just like, no, 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 talking to camera about while I'm still processing. Yeah, that's and, true. And that was really also wild for me to go back to the idea of like on the outside, people don't know what's going on inside. Yeah. Unless they ask, unless, they unless ask. you tell them. Yeah. But these assumptions are quite damaging actually and hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to you with your, when you had to change all of your diet in terms of... Why your, did I have to do that? No, not why, but what happened? I mean, you can tell us if you want to, but you don't need to. But like, I'm more interested in what happened, what changed within you <laughs> <laughs> after you had to cut out all of these things from your life. I'm a completely different person. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, it's so crazy. I mean, I feel like the main, 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 main difference is I listened to my body for the first time in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what happened, basically. My body was like, yo, <laughs> hey. Hello, we're tired. Exactly. And I had never listened mm. to it. Like my whole life before, I was like, shut the fuck up. I'm sorry, I'm trying a lot. No. <laughs> my whole life before I, until now, I mean, I still like, I had my therapy session this morning and my therapist was saying like, this is the part of sometimes when people are really in their heads, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm live in my head. Like I'm feel quite safe up there actually. But like here, pff, God, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No clue. So that, so, so that was my main thing is I started to listen to my body for the first time. I started to get to know it. And in giving it what it needed and in trust, in listening to it, it started to trust me mm. and I started to trust myself, Yeah, you know, like I'm able to give myself what I need. Oh my God. I'm able to give myself what I need. <laughs> what a it revelation. Was, it was a no, revelation. It is a revelation. Yeah. I, it yeah. was. And so I think that's the main thing. And so I learned, you know, several things like, self-love self-discipline and self-love are the same thing oh yes i remember you yes, yes. yeah um that oh, I'll was do a good one i felt a little bit like 
I was being told when I read that. I was like, okay. <laughs> that was not my intention. No, but it was a good one. Like, it was, it's true. And my dad, oh, my dad was like such a disciplined man. And it's funny, my sisters always think that compared in the family like I'm always seen as the like most disciplined one like most hardworking, mm. most disciplined like but I'm nothing in comparison to him he was like a very disciplined man and he really did things absolutely according to like what suited him and did not deviate at all from it Amazing. whether it was the time he ate time he slept mm. his times of his walks what he believed in what he read who he, sp- he was mm. very you know, and he just, and he followed that. And so it was remarkable because I think it it gave him a lot of peace, probably also a lot of control, understandable. Actually, I was going to say it gives him a lot of, like, I think it gives you freedom. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it frees you from having to think about these things. That is also true. You're right. You're right. It does free you from having to think of these things. And, but it also makes, gives you a certain consistency that is good for yourself, but also for others. Yeah. Like, you know what this person is about yeah. yeah, and what they stand for. I mean, I know this time I'm going into a bit more bigger things than like just your food, but it kind of does all relate. Yeah. Um, and self-discipline and self-care, they are, they, they are in tandem ultimately. And I think that's how like, I mean, I really feel like for so long, and it's so funny because, I mean, we all have this, right? We all have these different voices and one wounded child and the wise woman. And I mean, I'm on this whole journey of becoming friends with them all. But I feel like for a long time, I really didn't trust myself at all, you know? Mm. And like, I was afraid, like, and so, I mean, I say that to say, like, I'm a person, I'm the person who wrote a book, yeah. who be- who's very you know brave and honest in it. And I'm also the person who, didn't trust herself at Mm. all and was like afraid to speak is still afraid often to speak or to say how I feel my worst fear is like someone knowing that I have needs or something you know like (laughs) what does your therapist say I mean (laughs) Uh, but like that you know so it's Mm. like actually having to be so like People are eating pizza. Oh, I'm not going to eat pizza. I'm going to eat right, like right. something else, you know, like such a silly example. No, but like it, trying to not. Uh, having to have my own back, yeah, yeah. having to do what I need, regardless of whatever that anyone else is doing, because this is what my body needs from me right now. And realizing that I was able to do that, actually, mm. whoa, I had willpower, you know, like all of these things and every small decision that I made that was a good decision for me proved to me that I could make good decisions for myself. Maybe. And and with every single thing that I did and decision that I made and change and blah, 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 I built trust with myself. And I think that has is reverberating now in like lots of interesting ways, actually. And in my relationships, I'm finding it a lot easier to have boundaries you know, which I never really was able to do before. I was always like very, very people pleasy, um, always afraid, not trusting again myself, blah, 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 all of these things. And like, yeah, now I'm I'm much um, better at it. Mm. Interesting, the boundary, the B word, it's like mm. the big buzzword, right, of the decade boundaries. Uh, but it's true, we do need them. Well, especially us as women and Arab women who are absolutely oh, no, not told that i mean what? Yeah. What? exactly <laughs> no no they're considered when you put them up you're considered rude oh 100 percent. considered like you don't you were you're you know, selfish you're selfish rude you weren't raised correctly like that's just yeah i also agree this is definitely not just a uniquely arab woman mm. thing but yes for sure um and i think when you add to it the kind of immigrant experience there's another layer within that which has to do with a bit of fear or you know conforming mm. not wanting to stick your head up you know just like stay low thanks for having key. me <laughs> um but yeah it's also very uh relevant i guess to now and what is happening in the world uh, politically um Boundaries have definitely been drawn across uh, across everyone's lives. Um, some good, some bad, some big, huge walls. 
have you found that your boundaries have increased or hardened since um, October? I mean, it's funny because when I think, I mean, it's not funny, but when I think about like how I have felt and what's been happening in me since October, boundaries is not the word to co- that comes to mind. It's, mm. but maybe, maybe it is boundaries, but I've been feeling very isolated mm. and I, it doesn't feel like a boundary, but maybe it is, but like, I've been feeling very like, I just want to be alone in my house yeah. and like, what on earth? And who is, who are you guys? <laughs> and like, what is this planet? You know, um, there's like a real heartbreak, a heartbreak, not only at the tragic, outrageous loss of life, but also at like how it's being handled, how mishandled, sorry, how it's being like spoken about or not spoken about, like I feel like that is like an irreparable, how do you say the word? Chasm? Chasm? Yeah. Like that just, I don't know, like there's no, and I mean, yeah, I'm having my hair curly today or now these days is also like a random symptom of that. And it's, Mm. it's also like a heartbreak of like this idea of, you know, Western superiority western morality that extends to everything from you know what we look like how our, what our hair how it falls you know what god what god like same god but whatever we call you know all of these things reasons that our countries have been invaded colonized reasons why we've been made to feel less than like our lives are not worthy like we're able to be ethnically cleansed with no one even speaking out for us you know all of these things i don't want to straighten my hair and try and like adhere to these western ideals of who i should be or beauty standards or anything right Mm -hmm. and so it's interesting because i'm definitely not the only person to feel like this i've got my hair curly hair out yes Uh, solidarity no but also i agree i hear you that's definitely even pre-october i was reaching this conclusion Mm. of like, why? Why am I doing this? What am I saying? I'm basically saying I don't really accept myself. (laughs) Or I'm saying I think you are better. Yeah. I believe you when you say that you're you're, you're more beautiful, you know? Um, And I don't really, yeah. I mean, I think think since October, there's, I can't unsee any of this now. You're right. It's not about wanting to unsee. See, there is no choice in the matter. Mm-hmm. You cannot unsee. So it's, it's like a moot point, you know? <laughs> like, but it's like, what do I do with this yeah. now? Yeah. And I wonder maybe that is part of the isolation. Um, you know, yeah, you so. like we're writers. This is how we process is in our writing. But to do that, we need a lot of time mm. thinking. Mm. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe because there, this is not a, something that you're going to get an answer to, like in a minute, you know, it's going to take minutes. <laughs> and it's also actually, and this is something that people have also and other writers have spoken about, um, sort of our at least uh, Swana writers about the grieving and the mourning process. Because mm. we're mourning not just the death, of course, and the actual existence of Gaza, Gazin's, Palestine, the concept, humanity, but we're mourning so many illusions, so many belief systems. Mm. We're mourning friendships. You know, we spoke about that earlier. We've lost friends, you know, colleagues. When we say lost, we're not talking about they're dead. They're very (laughs) much alive. I just don't (laughs) want to talk to them ever again. They just decided to not be our friends or not show up. They decided to not be on the right side of humanity. They decided to not be on the side right side of humanity. There are, ver- there are various reasons why these people have sort of gone. Mm-hmm. And that's hard, very hard. You know, we take some, yeah, pride and solace in community. But I, I think it, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, basically, I think a lot of people are feeling that sense of, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's very like I'm feeling most and it's so it's so sad. Like I've lived here my whole life, you know, like I think part of the sadness as well is like our countries have been 
whether directly or indirectly impacted by colonialism, yeah. by like Western supremacy, by all of these things. So like the fact is like, I mean, Egypt is amazing. I love Egypt. I go all the time, but like I'm here in part because of yeah how Egypt became because, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Of course. So like, I don't, I mean, I'm lucky I could go to Egypt. There are other people who their countries are like kind of uninhabitable for lack of a, sorry, that's a horrible word no, to no, use. But but there, unfortunately, there are some countries that are uninhabitable. Like, well, almost, people live they, there, I they mean, are but, making them uninhabitable well, that's, or climate change or yeah. complete, you know, resource exploitation or consistent conflicts are making yeah. it uninhabitable. That's the thing. So I'm like, you know, the racist people here are like, well, go home then if you don't like it. And I'm like, but I am home. And also, where do you want me to, like, the, what, you know? Like, I'm here because of you guys as, as well. So I think it's, yeah, all of these things are kind of just like, really just feel really heavy. Like, I thought, I thought I did on some level think I was at home and I am at home. But why are you making me feel like this? You know, like, why do I have to be like, Palestinian lives matter? Like, why don't you know that already? Mm. And there's a, yeah, it's... Uh, How I mean, would you do to help yourself? I mean, you mentioned that you go to therapy instead mm -hmm. of longstanding. Oh yeah, I love okay. my therapist. She's my G for life. <laughs> What made you go to her in the first place? Or how did um, you get to her? I actually went to therapy when I was a teenager. Uh, although I don't feel like that was my choice. I think that was my parents being like, okay, dude. <laughs> um, so it's it's something... I actually studied psychology as well at yeah. university and stuff. So it's, it's always been, you know, an area of interest for me in terms of um, why do we think the way that we do? Like, I just mm -hmm. find it absolutely fascinating. So... I wanted someone to help me further explain to myself. It's always been like, that's how I came to writing. Yeah. Was, you know, I would journal, I would write poems. It was always to try and understand why am I feeling like this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Until now, it's, you know, completely a lifesaver. I don't know what I would do without writing. Thank God for writing. Thank God. Um, but so, yeah, the therapy is an extension of that yeah. almost, you know, it's an outside, outside voice to talk about myself with. I mean, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and has she been good during this period of time? Yeah, you? she has actually. Yeah. She really has. And I was a bit worried mm. um, because she's white, you know, like I wasn't sure. Uh, I think she's actually also Jewish, mm. um, but she fully, I mean, she's a human, so she understands. That's great. Mm. Uh, yeah, I was just having a conversation yesterday with um, like another guest and talking about like how would that be for therapists who weren't and, like for clients, mm. how would they feel? And I also thankfully no issue. And again, he's you know white male therapist and not you know um, not automatically like assume uh, alignment I mean, but but then again obviously you but you should <laughs> but as a, as a set as a therapist as well you're a job like i mean duh you should yeah. be a human that's what i meant when i said she's a human yeah. like that's true <laughs> that is very true yeah no that is good you also uh have your podcast what well, you had a podcast mm. called the talk of shame great title and exploring the whole concept of Aib, as we call it in Arabic, the things that, um, which you also write a lot about in your book, the things that we feel ashamed about, the ways they limit our lives, how the impact in conversation. What are some of the like key things you learned from the conversations that you had and around shame? Everyone feels it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the main one. Everyone feels it. And I think, I think that talking about it mm -hmm. and talking honestly is just so bloody important. Um, I think the more we give voice to the things that are quote unquote shameful, the less power they hold. Yeah. And I think that's how like, uh, there's, um, I mean, this is not directly to do with shame, but it's the same sort of idea in 
the second like the second wave of feminism i was reading about this the other year the how it sort of came to garner as much sort of power as it did was that women started to come together in in the us and they would talk about the things that were bothering them mm-hmm. you know their day to day lives their whatever and they started to realize like oh my god this is not like a me problem mm. it's actually a systemic issue or it's a broader thing you know and that was how they firstly stopped feeling like crazy and you know that they should just shut up and take it and also how change started to actually happen mm. and i think it's the same thing like it's why again it's so important to be in community it's why it's so important to not allow shame to silence us mm. because actually it's in the speaking it's in the usurping of our own shame to connect yeah that it loses its power and that also again we realize these are probably not even it's probably not even it's not even something to be ashamed of this is actually a systemic thing a lot of the time and maybe there's something that can be done about it you mm. know in terms of arab culture and shame mm. versus like let's say English culture and shame. Mm. Did you find a difference? Because when, off, like, instinctively, I wanted to be like, well, shame is more of a like Arab issue, mm. like, or, or an Eastern problem. This whole like, you know, we keep things hidden under wraps. We care more about appearances, other people. There are certain like written and unwritten rules. And I was like, oh, they don't really have that in the West. But mm. I don't know if actually, like, I'm gonna like, question myself on that. Like, maybe they do, but just it, it manifests differently. I mean, it's what a good you, question. What do you think? So for the podcast Talk of Shame, I was one season like a few years ago. I'm just saying, just like, so my memory's not like amazing. But it was also only Arab women. Okay. Um, so okay. I actually didn't look outside in yeah. terms of like, how does it impact other people differently? Uh, I think you're right though. I mean, a big part of a big part of it and the reason why we have so much Aib, Aib, Aib is we really care what other people think. Yeah. You know, or we're made to where our families care. Like it's, mm-hmm. we're very much a, a communal. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that does make a difference. Like we're very much a communal thing. Even if we have small families or whatever, we are part of a broader community that I think in the West people don't, or don't as much, you know, it's much more like nuclear. Yeah, um, it's true. It's true. So do you think that gives them more freedom to yeah. not like basically? Yeah. yeah. So, but, but conversely, I mean, I think you'll probably agree with this statement. It's generally been the most consistent one that people say about like what they love or take the most mm. from the, from their particular culture is the community. It's so beautiful as well. So it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. <laughs> as is most things it's so beautiful as well a hundred percent and also that <laughs> yeah and also yeah it's just yeah that's the reality mm. um but i think maybe people like you having your voice where you can kind of say you can have both is is where the change or the chink happens in the armor of being like well if you want this because in a way i feel like the subtle and maybe not so subtle also um challenge against being you know non-conformist is saying you will be exiled from said community right so if one is able to show more and more examples of like actually Mm. you can be your honest self and authentic self and still have a connection to your Mm. community which I think you do really well because you go back and forth to Egypt. You're very connected to there. Mm. You're very obviously like a proud Swana Arab woman, but you're also very much your individual Mm. self. You know, I think what's so beautiful and like it was beyond my expectation is the response again, like the, in the book, I'm really, and I mean, my next book, God help us all. We'll God. Get onto that. In a <laughs> um, but I feel like I, yeah, I was very open in the book and I, and I wasn't sure how it would be received, like, especially from my like aunties and, you know, my mom and like these kind of, yeah, I was, I was concerned or concerned is the wrong word, but apprehensive. And I think what was really beautiful is like, they all relate to. Amazing. And 
And my mom actually put together this like book club thing with like all her friends and like she wanted me to like oh, yeah it was really that cute. Is so cute. And I went and I like oh, spoke. Mom. It was really cute. And like oh and these were like the aunties that like they were, were fine with it. They were like, like, "Oh my god, thank you for saying this." Wow. Yeah, we felt this too. We feel this too. Oh. Thanks, you know? And like, okay, maybe I'm not going to go and like scream it in the street, but thank you for screaming it. Wow. Yeah. Well done them. I was really like, oh, it really touched me. And I think again, it just made me realize like we are afraid. Everyone's afraid. Mm. Everyone is afraid. And like when, you know, these, a lot of the time, these Zaib things and stuff come from like the older generation of women, sadly, I think a mm. lot of the time. And I think the reason why is because they think that that's, that's what they needed to do in order yeah. to try and live a safe, happy life, or that's what they had been told they needed. And so they're just passing on that same warning mm -hmm. of like, this world is scary and da da da. And like, in order to be safe and happy and healthy, this is what you should do. Yeah. And, you know, in that, at that point in time, that was probably very much the case. But then things evolve. And then if we do have that privilege, which sort of circles back to what you were saying initially. It's like, if I do have this ability, if I do have this freedom and this privilege, then like, what am I going to do with it? Mm -hmm. um, which is how I feel a lot about what is happening now in Palestine and with Palestinians. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, is also part of the challenge and the difficulty when you see people not doing that um but also we're so lucky right and i've been thinking about this a lot like i'm self-employed yeah no one can fire me yeah i am gonna scream on instagram no yeah. one can fire me someone else could get fired maybe they can't post as much yeah. and i think this is what you were saying in terms of like what are we going to do with that privilege right like mm -hmm. i'm you know we are able to speak loudly and to okay let's fucking do it yes yeah. That's absolutely true. That's true. I remember when the, the in the thing exact same thing. I remember thinking like, if I don't, then how can I expect mm. anybody else to? Like, well, of course I can't. I need to. You need to. I need to model that. And then, but it's also to say that the, you know, posting and all the like is one avenue, but yeah. it's certainly not the only one. No, of it's course, certainly not the only one. And I do think that's also important to to like recognize for 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 just yeah i mean right. you've been doing so many amazing things oh, well, thank you i mean it's not i feel like barely i always feel when it comes to this like i could do always more but thanks yeah but that's I mean, how everyone is yeah. always gonna feel and that's the drive that keeps us doing stuff yeah it's a weird one it goes back again when you said it's not even a choice you know mm. it just wasn't even a choice it just wasn't i mean it's like what my whole life was about and a moment came and I felt like I was you know asked in a way like again purpose and to show up mm. and 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 I have and you know will continue to because there is no alternative that I know I would be okay with mm. and that I could live with myself with so. can I ask do you feel like I mean I, I, do you feel like there's been a crack in the dam definitely there's been a crack in the dam it's very historic momentous i mean i grew up here my father's palestinian i always knew about palestine um and i was always talking about it and god well i mean first of all it was not always well received definitely mm. not wasn't i went to english schools and international schools people didn't know when i say palestine they wouldn't even know where it was which understandable but like for us this is ridiculous mm. like the, I, what do you mean you don't know where palestine yeah. is but like that and and i get it it was erased from the map so it wasn't it wasn't there um but these things have been going on for 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 years and decades and protests and marches but nothing like this mm. This is on a different, very different scale. It, it does come off the back of decades of hard work. This is the thing. I think it's key to know, like, there's, there's decades of hard work and advocacy and fighting and, 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 and keeping the stories alive, you know, that preceded this. Mm. 75 years is, is a long time. Like, I know it's not in the grand scheme of things, but it's also like 
generations. It's generations. Like you, you would be understandable if people had forgotten about it. And like nobody's forgotten about no. Palestine. Everyone, they you know, like generate grandchildren and their grandchildren. And that has been that legacy, enduring legacy. Mm. I think this is where the word samud and steadfastness, when it comes from, it's this idea mm. is that you, you have this goal, mm. you have this objective, you have this conviction and you just stay the course. Mm. You stay the course no matter what. And this is, I think, where we are at. It's also a result of things being just so horrific mm. that even the willfully blind is being made to see, mm. you know, like there is, and even if they don't want to accept it, it's right. It's here. Mm. You can't say you didn't know. We can't say blah, blah, blah. Here it is. Mm. So this combination I think also coming off the back of really, quite frankly, a decade of the world being topsy-turvy, people are increasingly um, dismayed at the way the world order is, mm -hmm. the governments that um, make decisions that are rarely in the interests of people. So, and then, so, so I think it's like Every the confluence yeah. of factors yeah. and a youth that quite frankly is like enough is enough. <laughs> I mean, if anyone knows what, how to enforce boundaries it's them mm. they're just like no <laughs> i mean we're all online now right we're like, all online of course we're all connected like mm -hmm. we can see things that we could never have seen before yeah so it's it's very big it's mm. very big and i predict it will continue to be very big for a while i think we're really honestly looking at quite a few tumultuous years ahead mm. of us um and i think we need to be prepared in whatever way we can you know if you need to like get your community together, get your family together, get your mental and emotional yeah. health together because you're kind of going to need, you're going to need all of that, I think, for mm. what is ahead. I don't even know what's ahead, but I know it's going to be. I mean, I think messy. that, I think, and then we were kind of talking about this a little bit before we started um, recording, but like the idea of like, what to like what what are we fighting for like are we like you know the idea of yes. like joy as resistance like you know the, the the tools like i don't know i've been really thinking about like what can i put in my toolbox yeah what do i have in, in my yeah. tools and like one of them for sure therapy i go yeah. to therapy every single week yeah um my G, I told you. I journal every single morning. That's great. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things like, again, nature, like you were saying, spending time in nature, um, people that we can trust and like feel safe and at home with, like finding those. And I think this also maybe is, is contributing to my like own, again, this idea of like building trust with myself, idea of like boundaries, da -da -da, all of these things, because you have to yeah you have to also look the thing the reality is things are going to come up like what we're witnessing so acute now like we are all being triggered and upset in ways that are very multi-faceted complex mm. i'm just grateful that i had started my sort of therapeutic healing journey a couple a few years ago mm. and so had cleared things yeah. not everything but cleared some and and had a good deal of awareness of, about myself mm. that now when things are happening and again we touched on this before it's like i can feel myself I'm very sensitive i'm not and and i don't want to say i'm taking things in the wrong way but i know that i'm getting more upset you have a about shorter things. fuse shorter fuse also i'm just maybe a little bit like looking at things with a slightly tainted lens mm. maybe um i'm uh, certain other things are being triggered in me that aren't necessarily even that don't even fully make sense mm. like i'm still like trying to figure it out but i imagine like i at least have a 50 percent a bit of clarity you know mm. what's this what's my ego what's my inner child what's what's yeah. happening here um and then some practices but like still there's still like i need the toolbox needs to be <laughs> filled with more things community is great but also like now i need more time alone to be able to process things also because within the community so happens that we're all hurting so i think there's also that recognition 
okay, who do we need mm. to maybe be a bit more like finding our outlets elsewhere? Mm. Exercise, physical, really important. You know what I've been loving? What? Boxing. Yeah, boxing's great. Oh, uh, yes. Boxing's uh, amazing. And you just get, like, have, yeah. have you done co box? No. There's, so, I, what I love about, about co box, and there's many different places, I'm sure, all around the world, is like, it's a dark room oh. and the music, I mean, you can oh, see. Oh, you mean like in this like pumping? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the yeah, music's yeah, pumping yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're just like, oh, yeah. it's so good. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. Actually, my trainer said to me the, uh, the other day, no, next we should do some boxing. Mm. So I no, it's amazing. Anything that you can get that feeling that all of that aggression and rage and anger and sweat, like bring it out is, is very, very key. Um, what other things would you put in your toolbox your mental health toolbox maybe that are a bit more from your own culture i mean culture i'm i'm really trying to get into praying okay i grew up in a very secular i suppose is the word family where mm-hmm. like no one prayed or anything and uh yeah i mean i've definitely found quite a lot of like peace and solace in god yeah uh who would have known a lot of people. No, I, I, a lot I, of people would have known. <laughs> yeah, about a few billion or so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's been really nice. Um, I mean, I know you've been doing that. De- you've been doing the Depka, which is amazing. Yeah. Not great on the knees, but it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, it's amazing. Really amazing. So many elements of what we were talking about combined in the Depka. Mm. There's the community solidarity because you're in this line and you have to stick together um shoulder to shoulder literally for the dance to work mm. um there's the the physicality you are definitely working up a step there's a jumping and the stomping that has this sense of like empowered aggression to it and then there's a the connectivity to like lands and homelands so amazing. it's like in this one sp- space there's a lot i feel like it's amazing been, yeah i mean it's been a weird like so it's been an interesting time for me because in addition of course to i mean everything that we've just been talking about i'm also writing a book my second book um and last time i wrote a book i basically disappeared off the face of the planet mm. and no one saw me and so that's also been interesting is like is part of my like desire for isolation mm, also yeah. that i'm writing, writing you know um what, but what is the second book about it's a fiction okay mm. it's fiction it's i mean i don't want to say too much about it because it's really early it's really early days mm-hmm. but i feel like this is exactly what i need to be writing right now nice and that yeah so it's it's taking a lot of my focus so i think that's actually been a huge tool in my toolbox actually is like to just like relinquish myself to this act of creation which is i mean i'm quite woo woo about these things but i really do believe that creating is i just finished doing the artist way have you done it I mean, I bought the book, but I haven't done it's amazing. all of the things that I'm supposed to do. It's amazing. I know everybody says so. It's life changing, really? and and I think again to go back to my like, I didn't trust myself. I was mm. scared and stuff. It really helped me with that, and it is relevant to what I'm talking about. I haven't just gone somewhere else, <laughs> but it talks about basically how um, creating is a gift from God, like, you know, yeah, yeah, I get it. And I think for so long, I really felt like, or I was worried that I was like arrogant or who do you think you are to write this or say this or whatever. And so I think having now got rid of that, having just finished, finished the artist way a few months ago, I feel very like in flow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And those are the only times at the moment where I feel really, not only times, but the most times where I feel like really at peace, really present, Mm. really like grounded is when I'm creating because I'm in... I'm in the universe. Yep. I'm connected yep. to it all. Yeah. And so that, yeah, that's been really life saving actually. Yeah. No, I completely understand and relate. And 
I think my ability to write during this period of time has been also incredibly helpful mm -hmm. as well as it being, yes, my, my job, but really having the ability to process and then express there is this alchemy, you mm -hmm. know, that happens within that. And then also to be, to have that read and received is also another very beautiful aspect to that. For sure. That is all part of this expressive healing process. For sure. And I, yeah, I definitely second that gratitude that you expressed, like, thank goodness <laughs> for writing. Like, thank goodness I have that. Like, I'm not a musician. I imagine this is like musicians when they're like, okay, I have my music. Mm. That's how, you, yeah, I have my words. And, um, but I do want to say, yeah. I think I, like, I don't want anyone listening to be like, oh, well, you guys, that's your job or whatever. Like at the end of the day, we are all, and again, the artist way talks about this so much. Like we are all artists. Yeah. We are all creating life, lives, yeah. you know, our life. We are all artists. And so you don't need to like be a published author to like sit and journal about your feelings, you know? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely not. And there are all sorts of manners of expression, you know, whether it's like, you're a designer exactly. or you make clothes or whatever you're building. You like paint There's some, throw so some many, paint around. So many things, so many things. But that act of expression, yes, absolutely, is it's a beautiful process. Um, and one I definitely add to the toolbox. And also even more so when it's not your job, actually. <laughs> like the, when you, you mentioned throwing paint around, like I really don't know how to paint, but I love doing that mm -hmm. as a, as a just a purely releasing yeah. i'm just throwing stuff on nobody cares like there's no editor who's gonna be like mm, i really <laughs> like that because i'm not doing that for that yeah. work and so that's really nice um and then i just want to end with saying what uh would you if you could like dispense of from your background that would maybe ease your mental health burdens what would wow it be? if i could get rid of anything yeah uh, from when you say background mean culture yeah honestly real talk yeah the idea of what people are gonna think yeah it's fucking tiring and i actually don't even know i mean are people even thinking that much about us i mean so i definitely know some people are gossiping and stuff people yeah you know, but like does it, ah, that one that one can go in the bin yeah i thought that's probably what since we spoke about it so much earlier. And I think it can. And you know what? I think you've really made a very good point and raised this question. Do people really care? I don't think so. And it doesn't matter. Actually, I mean, that thing doesn't matter is, yeah, but that's a, that's a, that's an us thing. We need to get over, like, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter, ultimately. <clears throat> um, and in some ways, when these really big life things happen, it really puts, like, you know, the whole thing puts mm. it into perspective. It's like... When I, when after October and Gaza, and of course there was a decision I could have made, like go very public online, don't go very public online. Previously I posted here and there, but I haven't, not like, not the way I am now, mm -hmm. right now. It's just like all the time. And then like speaking, going to events and reciting poetry in public and all of that. It's very like, here I am. Mm -hmm. But it was like, again, I said, there, there's no choice. It felt like for me, and it didn't matter. The consequences in my mind, didn't matter but when i think about how much time prior to that i had spent thinking about if it did or it didn't whether on that topic or something else and then it's like it takes unfortunately these really big things mm. like it doesn't matter mm -hmm. man like people are under the rubble like i care mm. like do i really care what someone thinks about me right now of course that comes with the privilege that we discussed earlier but like this is one element but if you if you if you extrapolate from that across the board like who cares why do we why ever? does it matter it doesn't but also what i liked about what you raised was another way of thinking about it, it was like do you really think anyone cares like actually given everything that's going on in the world <laughs> Cost of living crisis, <laughs> climate change. There's like Gaza on fire. There, you know. I mean, everyone's right own groups, problems. Like, and then that's not to mention then their own, like yeah. their kids, their husband, their wife, their whatever. Like, do they actually care about Leila and Alia <laughs> and what they're doing online? Probably not. Or in their or lives. In their lives, they they don't. Yeah, they don't. 
And if they do, I mean, you guys have way too much time on your hands. It's actually also kind of arrogant for us to think otherwise. (laughs) I mean, if you really think about it, like I like that because one time my friend did kind of put it to me in those terms and it was a good wake up call. Mm. She said, Leila, with all due respect, it's a bit arrogant for you to think that people like it wasn't actually about people caring. I was saying more about like, I feel like I should have done better Mm. and this or that. And she was like, it's a little bit arrogant of you to expect that of yourself. Like almost like, who do you think you are? You're just a human. And it was really helpful. I mean, not to like start a whole other combo, but I feel like it's such the thing that we're told when we're young though, right? Like, don't do this. What's your aunt going to think? Don't do that. What's your neighbor going to think? So actually it doesn't come from nowhere. Like we're very much fear mongered with this idea of what are people going to think? Uh, people don't care. People don't care. She says to you. Yeah. I mean, that was it. People don't care what you think. Alia, thank you so much for taking this hour to spend with me to talk so openly, to share what you've learned, to share what you're working on. Obviously you are to be followed Alia Mura on Instagram. Also the greater conversation newsletter community. Absolutely highly recommend great writing. I'm looking forward to reading your book. I'm not going to ask you when it's, when it's done, when it's out, <laughs> because people ask me that all the time about mine and I hate it because it makes me feel bad. It's just about to ask. <laughs> no, yet, no, sometime, someday. <laughs> Um, stay tuned it w- it's coming but yeah uh, best of luck Can't with wait. it and and um, yeah thanks so much for having me it it's been really fun. nice to chat yeah it's really great thank you thank you for listening to this episode Check out the show notes for more details about my wonderful guests, including where you can find them on social media. If you enjoyed listening to this, please do spread the good word, share with friends, family, cousins and colleagues. And please, please, please like and leave a review on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast. Your support is crucial for the show's success and a couple of clicks from you will mean the world to me. Go to my website, leilamagrabi.com and follow me on Instagram and Twitter for more news on future episodes.